Welcome to Where Are They Now? We reach into the archives of Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Seneca High Schools and invite selected alumni to share memories and fill us in on their career paths after commencement. Since Lenape's first graduating class in 1961, Shawnee's in 1972, Cherokee's in 1978, and Seneca's in 2005, over 65,000 individuals have received diplomas from these four schools. Here now is your host, DJ Deeney. Welcome to another episode of Where Are They Now? Today, we will be reconnecting with an alum from Shawnee's class of 2007, Julianne Stelmazic. Julianne is the founder and chef of Breaking Bread, a hands-on cooking and dining experience in Rome, Italy, where she also currently resides. Welcome to the show, Julianne. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. Um, let's go back. Shawnee High School, 2007. A lot of memories, a lot of, lot of fond experiences back then. Um, you were involved with many activities, and some of which led you to what you do today. Um, let's just talk about some of those memories that you remember from high school, um, starting out and, you know, what you kind of did there. Sure. Well, I was at Shawnee. Yes. So I was always a dancer. I grew up dancing since I was three years old uh, for Triplet Dance Academy. And I, and I did that all the way up until high school. So that kind of was a big part of my time at Shawnee. I was in the musical for all four years, not because of my singing skills, those are terrible, but because I was luckily able to dance. And the last three years, I actually choreographed it along with some of my classmates, which was very fun. That was for um, Pippin, 42nd Street, and uh, Once Upon a Mattress. So that I have really fun memories of that time when I was at Shawnee. And we actually performed at Cherokee because now that Shawnee has the, the new stage, we didn't have that when I was there, so we had to go over to Cherokee. Now, some of the teachers that, and um, people that you mentioned, Miss Labriola was obviously very involved with the musical. Uh, you have some fond memories of her? I always remember her yelling at us constantly. <laughs> She would constantly yell at us, her and Mr. Loudon, but Mr. Loudon was a little bit more relaxed. He would kind of come in after, after you know, the intense periods, and he would calm everyone down. But, you know, it was all in good fun, and she was a lot of fun to be around, and she, she dealt with a lot. She put up with a lot of stuff, considering, um, I don't know, we must have had 50 kids all involved with, from production to performance and, you know, all the prima donnas in the musical, so... Well, as a 16 or 17 year old kid, you doing assistant directing for the musical, that's got to be a lot of pressure and also a lot of responsibility for someone that's still in school. Yeah, it was a lot of responsibility and it was a lot of fun. And I, I really liked getting to know everyone. Um, and I really liked the performing part of it because, as I said, I'm not a very good singer and uh, not necessarily good at acting either. So because of dance, I was able to be in a big part of the show. So we had a lot of fun. I remember in 42nd Street, we had these giant coins that we built because we, you know, it's a tap dancing show. So we would tap dance on top of the giant coins on the stage. And that was fun to try to figure out how to build that um, for a temporary show. Now tell me about Miss Angelov. So Miss Angelov uh, was my Italian teacher. And I decided to study Italian because my grandfather is um, of Italian heritage. He's one of 12... Um, Southern, uh, Southern Italians that grew up in South Philly. And so I decided to study Italian when we were, had a choice to study a language, and I got to know Miss Angelov. And I had her for all four years um, at my time at Shawnee. And she was, she was a wonderful person. She was so laid back. She, she's definitely the reason that I came to live in Italy now, inspired me to study the language. I remember that she lived in Florence for seven years. And I thought that was so cool that she was fluent in English. You know, she was a native um, person from America. And uh, she was able to go and learn, an, uh, learn another language completely fluently. I was so amazed by that. Now, she's Miss Rabel now. Obviously, her name has changed since you were at Shawnee. Um, mm -hmm. You were in Italian club with her. You also are in the volunteer club. Talk about yes. the volunteer club. So the volunteer club, I remember, I don't remember as much from that. I remember that we... We went and um, we hosted like the Halloween parties at the school where the little kids would come like through the Like the trick holidays. or treating and stuff? Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. I remember doing that. And I places where uh, there was children with disabilities, we would go and 
I don't know, I think just entertain them and play with them. Um, that was one of the trips that we did away from school. We used to take a bus and go and do that. So you knew early on that you had an interest in foreign language and also in Italy, um, mm -hmm. but you decided to major in international affairs and environmental studies. Yes. How, what went into that decision? Did you have a major when you left high school or did you decide your major once you went to school? What went into your decision of choosing a school? Well, I actually wanted to be an actress. My dream was to go to NYU in New York City and be an actress. And thank God I didn't get into NYU. Um, that was, I think, a message to me for the, for my, for the rest of my life. Um, and so I got into Northeastern. And I went in undecided, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. And then my freshman year, we had these programs called Dialogues of Civilizations. And they're like mini summer study abroad programs. And so there was one going to Italy. And because I had my interest in in Italian language and the country, I said, okay, well, why don't I try to go to that? Uh, lo and behold, it was around food and policy, and it was right here um, in Rome, where I live now, and we studied uh, with my professor. So she got me completely um, passionate about food issues, um, agricultural sustainability issues, all these kind of things. So I came back to Northeastern, and then I started to kind of adjust to things that I was studying. And then le that le led me into the degree that I, that I eventually chose. You went to Northeastern from 2007 to 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, any specific memories, experiences that you can share that kind of uh, really stay with you today? Uh, great friends. I made the, sec the first place that I, uh, that I lived when I moved in. I remember um, I met a, a friend, a very good friend of mine today. My parents have a house up in Lake Placid, and I remember, you know, you're a freshman, you go and you don't know anyone, and we were announcing where we're from, and one girl said she was from Lake Placid, so I clung on to her, and I said, oh my gosh, you know, I've been going there since I was little, and we made friends right away, and we just had the best time for all five years that we were there, and luckily, because my school put such an emphasis on international mindedness, I had a lot of opportunities to travel and study abroad. I came to Italy twice. I worked in San Francisco and I studied in Brazil all as part of my degree program. Talk about graduation and subsequently what happened after graduation. Yeah, so I graduated from Northeastern in Bo I was in Boston and I had plans to stay in Boston. Um, I actually got a job through my school. We have this program called a cooperative education. It's called a co-op. Drexel has it as well, a little closer to, to um, Medford. And so through my school, I got a job at a solar company. It's called Brightfields Development. So I started working there um, for six months. And then I kept having this draw to go, to leave Boston, to go abroad and, and study somewhere or work somewhere. I just wanted to travel, and I wanted to continue my passion for food. And so I heard of this program called the Rome Sustainable Food Project, which is a part of the American Academy in Rome. And so I applied to this position, this culinary stage. I got accepted, and then that was kind of the message. And I said, okay, I'm going to go. I'm, and I just moved right to Italy in 2013, and I've been there ever since. So you've been there for quite a while. It's funny you don't have, haven't picked up any accent or anything like that in your time there. Yeah, I th well, I picked up some hand gestures maybe. You know, I, my, my friends always make fun of me because when I come back, I start using my hands more than, than, than they do. But no, I haven't picked up an Italian accent, but I, st I, I still have a little bit of an American accent in, in Italian. Gotcha. Um, so now, your experience is starting in 2013 to your current position now and what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. What were some of the things that you did before you got to your uh, current position? It was not always so clear how I was going to get where I am today. And I'm glad that I didn't really know and have a plan because if I had known, maybe I would have left Italy before and not had the opportunity to do what I'm doing now, which I love. So um, I guess it started following my culinary program, and I met this man, Carlo, when I was renting houses for like two, mo two terrible months. I, I hated that job, but the good thing that came out of it was I met this man, Carlo, who's a chef in Rome. He's lived his whole life here. He doesn't speak a lick of English, and so I learned a lot of Italian becoming friends with him. We had this idea to start cooking classes. And so um, we started just with expats um, living here in Rome, working for the international organizations, some Italians who wanted to learn English, and then tourists and a couple students that were studying Italian in Rome. 
And so we called it um, Breaking Bread. And the idea was to have these communal dinner classes where we would um, learn about the history of Roman food. We would learn about where it comes from, what kind of things are grown in season. We would cook together in a very hands-on way. And then we sit down at one big table and we eat together. So we're still doing this today. That was, I guess, two years ago we started that. And now it's mostly for tourists and student groups, but a lot of fun. And um, so in the meantime, while I was doing that, uh, back to the American Academy, I got connected with um, this woman, Nancy, who's a landscape architect, and her son was going to a school called St. Stephen's, which is where I work now. And she said, you have to help. Oh, my gosh, the food needs uh, to improve. We need to have a vegetable garden. You know, please come and work at the school. So I said, okay, I came to check it, check out the space. It's a beautiful school. It's right in the city center, right near the Coliseum. It's about a five-minute walk. So I came here, and I started volunteering with the kids. This was September 20, uh, 2014. So I started volunteering with the kids, and then um, soon enough, I began a consultancy at the school to start working with the dining services. And then I got hired the following year to do a full uh, gardens and sustainability program, which is what I'm doing now. So the food and gardens coordinator aspect, that's pretty much what you just described. Um, mm -hmm. But you also have an alumni relations coordinator as part of your title, I guess, at the school. Yes. Um, very different things. Uh, yeah. How does Kinda. that work? How do, yeah, how does that work? Well, I think, that, you know, this is my first time working for um, an interna a private international school. You know, I went to Shawnee, so I'm, I'm not necessarily tapped into the, the international school circuit. But what I've learned is that um, these small schools, we're only 290 students here, more or less. So these small schools, they don't have the ability to hire many people and have just one position. And so um, a lot of the teachers and a lot of the faculty here wear many hats. So those are kind of the two hats that I wear here. Um, the gardens and sustainability piece, and then alumni relations. But they do go together in some ways because it's essentially building a new program. Our alumni relations program here is still only a couple of years old. And so it's a lot of, you know, um, strategic planning and creative thinking. We're doing social media. We're doing a lot of communications. Same kind of thing with the gardens and sustainability component. It's a lot of newness. And so there is some overlap. Um, in those two positions. Now, how does your, if at all, does your breaking bread um, occupation kind of filter into your food and gardens position? Well, it filters in in the sense that I'm, I'm still very much connected to the Rome Sustainable Food Project, who has, um, they're also in the, set, uh, the city center, and they have a, um, an edible garden program, and they source from local farms in the area. Um, so I'm very much connected to that, I guess, the local food scene in Rome through that. And I'm also beginning to do some cooking classes and food education courses with the students at the high school, St. Stephen's. So it allows me to have, you know, a constant flow of uh, chefs or, or food experts, um, access to a kitchen, all of those kind of things make it easier for me to offer a better program for those students at this high school. Um, but it is a good question because Rome is a unique place, or Italy is rather a unique place. Anyone who's lived here or traveled here knows that it can get a little bit uh, disorganized. And one thing I've, one skill that I've learned living in Rome is is how to hustle, and you definitely have to learn how to do those things here. You know, you have to have, find your find your niche and just go for it. Okay, now you talk about teaching classes and that type mm -hmm. of thing. How did you, uh, I guess, learn yourself as far as the uh, culinary aspect went? And I think we kind of glossed over that a little bit as far as your actual expertise and, and mm -hmm. how you learned, because that's not obviously that wasn't your major. Um, w w how did that go come about? Yeah, I mean, I think my uh, my major really taught me more about the the social aspects and scientific aspects, also of climate change. And then um, when I started, when I began to study here that summer with the professor, the food policy course, I started to get more curious about this whole um, issue that we're facing, really, with agricultural issues and, on a bigger level, environmental issues. So um, I guess I never underestimated the value of the apprenticeship or having a mentor. 
And so rather than continuing to pay for more education and getting in debt, I decided to do some hands-on um, learning learning uh, experiences. So the Rome Sustainable Food Project, um, they didn't pay us, but I was able to live there for free. I lived right in the center, and for four months I studied there. I worked 70-hour work weeks, and I worked under two uh, or three amazing chefs, and I learned a ton about um, Italian language, um, Roman food history, um, pr uh, how to work in a professional kitchen setting. I also uh, WOFT, which is kind of a silly acronym, but it's it's a it's worldwide opportunity for organic farming. It's basically a volunteer farm exchange, and so I did that as part of my co-op, uh, my senior year at university. So I decided to go uh, woofing to go work on farms. I worked on an olive farm, a uh, cheese farm, and I did the vendamia, which is the the wine harvest. So I learned a lot of you know hands-on hands-on learning in those kind of fields and then uh, just a lot of self-exploration and uh, self-study I, I read a lot I'm really interested in these kind of things and you know I guess it's brought me to where I am today now is um, breaking bread considered would you consider it like an organic operation then is it all organic or is it uh, you know is there anything that wouldn't be organic in there in terms of the food? Yes. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, y you know, organic means something different here in Europe than it does in the U.S. Um, so we're not so obsessed with the organic or the, call it the biologic uh, certification. It's more, for me, what it matters to me is more about the sourcing. So we, we try to source from small producers, um, local farms, family-owned farms. We're lucky because in Rome we have year-round produce. We get cheese and meat and vegetables and fruits all year, so we're totally spoiled. So it's actually very easy to source those kind of things. And by sourcing from the small farms, you know, we can develop relationships with them and just ask them if they use pesticides or genetically modified organisms or um, anything like that. We can have a better relationship with them. Is the certification, and I guess you would call it certification, or um, restrictions and regulations, are they the same in Italy as they, I guess, as they are here? Like, are things labeled that way when in the stores? And yeah, the uh, well, the U.S. is pretty uh, pretty lax on that stuff. But with yeah, without getting into, I guess, the particulars of it, the FDA and the USDA is, are what are the regulating bodies in the U.S. And in Europe, it's it's a different. Um, it's a different system. They're, they have a lot more restrictions here. Um, I think in France they've outlawed genetically modified GMOs. Um, in Italy, I believe they've also gone that way. Um, they also have something here called biodynamica or biodynamic, which is kind of another level. It's not just looking at what we put into the into the food, like pesticides and fertilizers, but it's also looking at the whole uh, earth care and land care. Um, process. So that's another level of certification that they have here that we don't really have in the U.S. So do you think that um, obviously your business that you started focuses around that type of, I guess, organic uh, nature to the food? Are, is mm -hmm. most of the food there already like that, though? Or is, is yours a unique situation? Well, some people may disagree with me, but uh, from what I find, Italy is, you know, 10 to 20 years behind the U.S. in some ways, and in some ways it's good, and in some ways it's bad. Um, so yes, right now, uh, local food is cheaper. If you go to a farmer's market in the U.S., I worked at one in Boston while I was at university, and it was very expensive to um, for farms to af afford to grow that way. You know, you go to any, you know, you go to Manhattan, and you go to a local farmer's market, anything that you buy there, any produce is going to cost significantly more than at some normal supermarket, unless you go to Whole Foods, of course. Um, and here it's the opposite. Local food is still cheaper. However, it's changing. So we have a different, a different kind of cultural phenomenon happening here where the Italians are more interested in the junk food, fast food world, right? And where the people that can't afford those kind of things, they're actually eating very simple foods like healthy vegetables, um, you know, greens, bread, veggie, um, veggies, uh, simple meats, those kind of things. So it's kind of 
the opposite situation of what's happening in the U.S., where the wealthy and educated tend to eat more local and nutritious. Here, it's kind of the opposite that's beginning to happen. So I think it's an exciting time to be here because um, it's a time when the, the younger generations are you know, moving into cities, unemployment is high, people aren't really living in the countryside anymore. I think 60 or 70 percent of the population live in, in urban settings. And so, um, so it's a really important time to get them uh, to maintain that connection with the land and to keep the local food cheaper. You said that Italy's kind of behind with some things, but in reality, it seems like they're actually ahead of the game in banning GMOs and, you know, that type of thing is actually ahead of where we might be in some places here. That's true. And I think I, 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 I have to say, I'm not sure if that's the Italians. I think it's probably a European right. mindset. Um, you know, I mean, Europe is obviously much older than the U.S. Um, if we're talking about, um, if we're not talking about Native Americans, we're talking about um, the British who went over. And so our culture is a lot newer in the U.S. And I, th I mean, from what I've read, and this is just a personal opinion, I think that Europe has a, a greater attachment to their land and more pride in that. So you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of people who have been farming the same piece of land, growing their food in the same way. And so they have a real kind of visceral attachment to that practice even if they're not thinking about, you know, the environmental impacts or, um, you know, the future of food. They're just saying, this is what my family's done for so long, and I don't want it to be taken away from me or changed. How does technology and computers and that type of thing, you know, how does it help somebody like you that maybe somebody like that wanted to do what you're doing 20 years ago maybe wouldn't have been as successful? Because obviously you're able to, I guess, access different type of programs online with your teaching and, and you know, you have Food Network here in the U.S. that you probably, you know, you can access those kind of shows and cooking shows from Italy. Like, what type of things do, does technology provide for you that maybe somebody before wouldn't have been able to do? Well, I think personally, um, technology has allowed, um, it's allowed me to travel in ways that I wouldn't have been able to travel before. Right, so the woofing experience, the, the farm exchange, I was able to sign up for that online and connect with all of the, the farms that I visited and, and where I lived all through, you know, technology, through email, whereas previously that wouldn't have been possible. Um, as far as teaching goes, I think there's a ton of resources right now. In Italy, the whole edible education um, phenomenon hasn't quite hit yet. In the U.S., it's really big. You know, you have Alice Waters, um, you've got Jamie Oliver um, in London. You've got a ton of different uh, celebrities that are really pushing for more nutritious food in schools, a uh, curriculum that are focused on environmental awareness and nutrition. So there's a ton of resources in the U.S., and so I've been able to access that through through technology, and it's been wonderful. Now, um, I guess, obviously, you're very passionate about what you do, and uh, it seems like it's something that, people in the U.S. would probably also be very interested in it. Have you ever thought about possibly maybe taking what you do and putting it out there online so that you can go international, much like we're doing today, going, you know, across the world to, to try to, you know, influence people in, in the way they live their lifestyle? Absolutely, yeah. We, uh, we're actually part of the Edible Schoolyard Network, which is a network of over 1,000, I think, uh, two or 3,000 schools around the world which is, was founded by Alice Waters in California about 20 years ago. So we're part of that kind of global network. We're also in communication with a Slow Food National Garden Program. Um, they're based out of Denver. I went and visited them this summer, so we're connected with them. So we already are, you know, connecting. We have international pen pal um, relationships with other schools. And, uh, yeah, we're, we've already been doing that a lot, and it's – I think it's really helpful for the students to see, hey, hey, this isn't just something that my teachers are asking me to do, but this is something happening all around the world. Now, what is uh, the favorite part for you of, of what you do, the favorite part of your job? Uh, I think the favorite part of my job is that I, that I um, don't do the same thing any, any day. Any given day, I have a completely different set of tasks, I might be working out in the garden, I might be cooking in the kitchen, I might be in a meeting talking about the menu, I might be um, 
Skyping with my alumni relations office from high school. Uh, we planned events also this fall for um, for my alumni relations position here at the school. So I get to travel, I get to teach, I get to cook. I, I just really like the day to day changes. Well, it sounds like your occupation, your job, they kind of blend into your hobbies. So um, obviously you mentioned some of those hobbies as you know, a sustainable food advocate and a farm volunteer. Uh, are there any other interest in hobbies that you, know, that you have that we may not have talked about through your job? Uh, I really like languages, which maybe that was obvious because I, I came to Italy for languages, but I really like languages. I'm studying Portuguese now and I want to keep learning other languages. I just think it's such a fascinating way to, to understand another culture and other people. So, um, yeah, that's another one of my passions. And you, I think you mentioned sailing also. Is that something you still do? Yeah, sailing. Yeah, I didn't mention sailing. I've been sailing my whole life. My parents are both captains, and they've been sailors since they were, you know, 21. I think they bought their, their first sailboat. I've been very fortunate to travel with them all over the world on the boat, and I think we're going to continue to do that um, in the next couple of years. So you obviously still see your family back home. Tell me a little bit about your family and, uh, you know, what you guys like to do. Sure. So my, I have a brother, Brian Stelmazic. He went to Shawnee as well. He's two years older than me. And, um, my mother and father, as I said, they they've, uh, they've retired and they now are, I guess, full-time sailing. They're about to they're about to embark on a, a trip around the world. So I'm hoping I can kind of meet up with them <laughs> in places that I want to go. My brother lives up in the Catskills, kind of like near Hudson. And he's a, he's a, a metal worker. He makes kind of like designs with, with metal. And he's, he's actually exploring some, some things with, uh, with solar, using solar as a part of a design process, which is pretty cool. And I, yeah, I, I'm fortunate because I get to go back for the holidays um, over uh, winter break, and I also get to go back in the summer for kind of two to three months. So I do see them a lot, and I'm very close with them. Well, going back to high school as we get ready to wrap up, anything about your high school experience that you would like to maybe go back and do again or redo or, or do differently that you can think of on the top of your head? Uh, I guess <laughs> I don't think I would do it again. And it's funny because I'm working at a high school right now, right. so you're already, do you're already doing it again. I know it's actually like I am doing it again, right? Um, it's funny you ask that because I I often think about my high school experience because I'm working with kids of the same age, right. and so um, it's kind of this this weird thing. Um, but no, I I wouldn't do it again. I had a great time. I had great memories. I had great friends. You know, you always have the stupid drama that everyone goes through that seems like the end of the world, and you look back, and it wasn't at all. Um, so I guess I would have maybe been a little bit less stressed about university or stressed about doing or saying the right thing, because in the end, it's just about finding out who you are as a person. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me a call. No problem. We've been talking to Shawnee alum Julianne Stelmazic a chef who currently lives in Rome, Italy. Thank you for joining us today on this international edition of Where Are They Now? And please join us next time for more alumni interviews on Where Are They Now? <laughs>